9, Circle 6, The Heretics, Summary. At the gate of Dis, the poets wait in dread. Virgil tries to hide his anxiety from Dante, but both realize that without divine aid, they will surely be lost. To add to their terrors, three infernal furies, symbols of eternal remorse, appear on a nearby tower, from which they threaten the poets and call for Medusa to come and change them to stone. Virgil at once commands Dante to turn and shut his eyes. To make doubly sure, Virgil himself places his hands over Dante's eyes, for there is an evil upon which man must not look if he is to be saved. But at the moment of greatest anxiety, a storm shakes the dirty air of hell, and the sinners in the marsh begin to scatter like frightened frogs. The heavenly messenger is approaching. He appears walking majestically through hell, looking neither to right nor to left. With a touch, he throws open the gate of Dis while his words scatter the rebellious angels. Then he returns as he came. The poets now enter the gate unopposed and find themselves in the sixth circle. Here they find a countryside like a vast cemetery. Tombs of every size stretch out before them, each with its lid lying beside it, and each wrapped in flames. Cries of anguish sound endlessly from the entombed dead. This is the torment of the heretics of every cult. By heretic, Dante means specifically those who did violence to God by denying immortality. Since they taught that the soul dies with the body, so their punishment is an eternal grave in the fiery morgue of God's wrath. My face had paled to a mask of cowardice when I saw my guide turn back. The sight of it the sooner brought the color back to his. He stood apart like one who strains to hear what he cannot see, for the eye could not reach far across the vapors of that midnight air. Yet surely we were meant to pass these tombs, he said aloud. If not, so much was promised. Oh, how time hangs and drags till our aid comes. I saw too well how the words with which he ended covered his start, and even perhaps I drew a worse conclusion from that than he intended. Tell me, master, does anyone ever come from the first ledge whose only punishment is hope cut off into this dreary bottom? I put this question to him, still in fear of what ha his broken speech must mean, and he, rarely do any of us enter here. Once before, it is true, I crossed through hell, conjured by cruel Erichtho, who recalled the spirits to their bodies. Her dark spell forced me, newly stripped of my mortal part, to enter through this gate and summon out a spirit from Judaica. Take heart, that is the last depth and the darkest layer, and the farthest from heaven which encircles all, and at that time I came back even from there." The marsh from which the sinking gases bubble lies all about this capital of sorrow, whose gates we may not pass now without trouble. All this and more he expounded, but the rest was lost on me, for suddenly my attention was drawn to the turret with the fiery crest, where all at once three hellish and inhuman furies sprang to view, blood-stained and wild. Their limbs and gestures hinted they were women, Belts of greenest hydras wound and wound about their waists, and snakes and horned serpents grew from their heads like matted hair, and bound their horrid brows. My master, who well knew the handmaids of the Queen of Woe, cried, Look, the terrible Arignes of Hecate's crew. That is Megara, to the left of the tower. Alecto is the one who raves on the right. Tisiphone stands between and he said no more. With their palms they beat their brows, with their nails they clawed their bleeding breasts, and such mad wails broke from them that I drew close to the poet, overawed, and altogether screamed, looking down at me, Call Medusa, that we may change him to stone, too lightly we let Theseus go free. Turn your back and keep your eyes shut tight, for should the Gorgon come and you look at her, never again would you return to the light. This was my guide's command, and he turned me about himself and would not trust my hands alone, but with his placed on mine, held my eyes shut. 
Men of sound intellect and probity weigh with good understanding what lies hidden behind the veil of my strange allegory. Suddenly there broke on the dirty swell of the dark marsh a squall of terrible sound that sent a tremor through both shores of hell, a sound as if two continents of air, one frigid and one scorching, clashed head on in a war of winds that stripped the forest bare, ripped off whole boughs and blew them helter-skelter along the range of dust it raised before it, making the beasts and shepherds run for shelter. The master freed my eyes. Now turn, he said, and fix your nerve of vision on the foam there where the smoke is thickest and most acrid. As frogs before the snake that hunts them down churn up their pond in flight until the last squats on the bottom as if turned to stone, so I saw more than a thousand ruined souls scatter away from one who crossed dry shod the Stygian marsh into hell's burning bowels. With his left hand, he fanned away the dreary vapors of that stink as he approached, and only of that annoyance did he seem weary. Clearly, he was a messenger from God's throne, and I turned to my guide, but he made me a sign that I should keep my silence and bow down. Ah, what scorn breathed from that angel presence! He reached the gate of Dis, and with a wand he waved it open, for there was no resistance. Outcasts of heaven, you twice loathsome crew, he cried upon that terrible sill of hell. How does this insolence still live in you? Why do you set yourselves against that throne whose will none can deny, and which times past has added to your pain for each rebellion? Why do you butt against fate's ordinance? Your Cerberus, if you recall, still wears his throat and chin peeled for such arrogance. Then he turned back through the same filthy tide by which he had come. He did not speak to us, but went his way like one preoccupied by other presences than those before him. And we moved toward the city, fearing nothing after his holy words. Straight through the dim and open gate we entered unopposed, and I, eager to learn what new estate of hell those burning fortress walls enclosed, began to look about the very moment we were inside, and I saw on every hand a countryside of sorrow and new torment. As at Arlis, where the Rhone sinks into stagnant marshes, as at Pola by the Quarnaro Gulf, whose waters close Italy and wash her farthest reaches, the uneven tombs cover the even plain. Such fields I saw here spread in all directions, except that here the tombs were chests of pain. For in a ring around each tomb, great fires raised every wall to a red heat. No smith works hotter iron in his forge. The buyers stood with their lids upraised, and from their pits an anguished moaning rose on the dead air from the desolation of tormented spirits. And I, Master, what shades are these who lie buried in these chests and fill the air with such a painful and unending cry? These are the arch heretics of all cults with all their followers, he replied. Far more than you would think lie stuffed into these vaults, like lies with like in every heresy. And the monuments are fired, some more, some less, to each depravity its own degree. He turned then, and I followed through that night between the wall and the torments bearing right. Canto 9 notes, lines 1 through 15, Dante's fear and Virgil's assurance. Allegorically, this highly dramatic scene once more represents the limits of the power of human reason. There are occasions, Dante makes clear, in which only divine aid will suffice. The anxiety here is the turmoil of the mind that hungers after God and awaits his sign in fear and doubt, knowing that unless that sign is given, the final evil cannot be surmounted. Aside from the allegorical significance, the scene is both powerfully and subtly drawn. Observing Dante's fear, Virgil hides his own. Dante, however, penetrates the dissimulation and is all the more afraid. To reassure himself, or to know the worst, perhaps, he longs to ask Virgil whether or not he really knows the way, but he cannot ask bluntly. 
he has too much respect for his guide's feelings. Therefore, he generalizes the question in such a way as to make it inoffensive. Having drawn so delicate a play of cross motives in such brief space, Dante further seizes the scene as an opportunity for reinforcing Virgil's fitness to be his guide. The economy of means with which Dante brings his several themes to assist one another is in the high tradition of dramatic poetry. Line 14 from the first ledge, that's Limbo. Line 20, Erichtho, a sorceress drawn from Lucan. Line 24, a spirit from Judaica. Judaica, or Judeca, is the final pit of hell. Erichtho called up the spirit in order to foretell the outcome of the campaign between Pompey and Caesar. There is no trace of the legend in which Virgil is chosen for the descent. Virgil, in fact, was still alive at the time of the Battle of Pharsalia. Lines 34 and following, the three Furies, or Araneas, in classical mythology, they were especially malignant spirits who pursued and tormented those who had violated fundamental taboos, desecration of temples, murder of kin, etc. They are apt symbols of the guilty conscience of the damned. Line 41, the Queen of Woe, Proserpine, or Hecate, was the wife of Pluto and therefore a queen of the underworld. Line 50, Medusa, the Gorgon. She turned to stone whoever looked at her. Allegorically, she may be said to represent despair of ever winning the mercy of God. The further allegory is apparent when we remember that she is summoned by the Furies, who represent remorse. 951, too lightly we let Theseus go free. Theseus and Perithus tried to kidnap Hecate, Perithus was killed in the attempt, and Theseus was punished by being chained to a great rock. He was later set free by Hercules, who descended to his rescue in defiance of all the powers of hell. The meaning of the Furies' cry is that Dante must be made an example of. Had they punished Theseus properly, men would have acquired more respect for their powers and would not still be attempting to invade the underworld. Lines 59 and 60, my strange allegory. Most commentators take this to mean the allegory of the three furies, but the lines apply as aptly to the allegory that follows. Dante probably meant both. Almost certainly, too, my strange allegory refers to the whole commedia. Lines 61 and following, the appearance of the messenger. In hell, God is expressed only as inviolable power. His messenger is preceded by great storms. His presence sends a terror through the damned. His face is the face of scorn. Line 95, Cerberus. When Cerberus opposed the fated entrance of Hercules into hell, Hercules threw a chain around his neck and dragged him to the upper world. Cerberus's throat, according to Dante, is still peeled raw from it. Line 104, the sixth circle. Once through the gate, the poets enter the sixth circle and the beginning of the lower hell. Lines 109 and following, Arlis, Pola, Situated as indicated on the Rhone and the Quarnaro Gulf, respectively, these cities were the sites of great cemeteries dating back to the time of Rome. The Quarnaro Gulf is the body of water in which Fiume is situated. Line 114, the heretics. Within the sixth circle are punished the heretics. They lie in chests resembling great tombs, but the tombs are made of iron and are heated red hot by great fires. The tombs are uncovered and the great lids lie about on the ground. As we shall learn soon, these lids will be put into place on the day of judgment and sealed forever. Thus, once more the sin is refigured in the punishment. For as heresy results in the death of the soul, so the heretics will be sealed forever in their death within a death. It must be noted, however, that Dante means by heretics specifically those skeptics who deny the soul's immortality. They stand in relation to the lower hell, as the pagans stood in relation to the upper hell. The pagans did not know how to worship God. The heretics denied his existence. Each group, in its degree, symbolizes a state of blindness. Other varieties of heretics are in Bolgia 9 of Circle 8. Moreover, in Dante's system, to deny God is the beginning of violence, bestiality, and fraud, and it is these sins which are punished below. Line 131, Bearing Right. Through all of hell, the poets bear left in their descent with only two exceptions. The first, 